This is a very exciting moment where we start discussing programming languages as the kinds of things that we ourselves can build. Now, most introductory computer science courses teach you a programming language, but only a few, such as this one, let you build your own. So that's what we're going to do today. We'll create a new programming language by putting together all of the elements that are needed to do so. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. Programming languages are ways of expressing computational processes. And a computer typically executes programs written in many different programming languages, all at the same time. So machine languages are a type of programming language that can be interpreted directly by your computer's hardware. What does that mean? That means there's a fixed set of instructions, things like addition and multiplication, that um, actually are invoking operations that are encoded in the circuitry of the central processing unit of your computer, which means the computer, by its very design, is able to carry out these instructions. But the operations themselves always refer to specific hardware memory addresses. There really isn't any me mechanism of abstraction in a machine language. Because we want to use abstraction in order to design programs that other people can read, we invent high-level languages. So a high-level language, in contrast to a machine language, has statements and expressions that are interpreted by another program, or they're compiled, which is a form of translation, into another language. So compiling a high-level language into a machine language would then give you an equivalent program in the machine language that can be executed by the hardware itself. Now, it's interesting that a programming language interpreter is just another program. In fact, that's perhaps one of the most fundamental concepts in programming in general and computer science, is to know that when we create our languages to express ourselves, we create them by writing interpreters that are just programs in other languages that we have created. Now, high-level languages are important because they provide means of abstraction, such as naming, function definition, an object system, etc. And these are the ones that people always learn first. Machine languages we still learn occasionally in order to understand how the computer works, but you can be very effective in developing software, running experiments, creating new ideas, only using high-level languages. And that's where most people spend their time. The nice thing about high-level languages is that they abstract away many system details so that you can write a program that's independent of the hardware and operating system that's running on your current computer. So for example, Python is a high-level language. We can define a function like this, which also binds the name square. Python is actually two languages, the Python language that we've been learning, and then there's a second language, very similar to a machine language, called Python 3 bytecode. And when I define this function, it gets translated into bytecode, which looks like this, which are instructions for not your particular machine, but an idealized or abstract machine. And then there is one more interpretation layer in between this bytecode and the actual machine language that is understood by the CPU of your computer. But that translation is very small. Whereas the process of going from Python code to bytecode can be quite complicated because this has a very limited set of instructions. It looks like a machine language. So for instance, there's multiplication built in to Python 3 bytecode, but it always just multiplies the last two things that were loaded in. So it can't refer to particular names because that's just not part of this language. And if you want to go from some Python to some Python bytecode, you just define a function and then you can use the built-in disassembler to print out the bytecode if you wish. Okay, so those are programming languages. Metalinguistic abstraction is the process of inventing new programming languages. So a powerful form of abstraction is to define a new language that's just right for the particular type of application or problem domain that we're interested in. So what do I mean by type of application? Well, there's a language called Erlang, and it was designed for concurrent programming, which means that it has built-in elements for expressing concurrent communication. 
Using the same message passing metaphor that we looked at in the object system, we can have lots of different concurrent streams of control that all talk to each other. And this is used, for example, to implement chat servers with many simultaneous connections when you have to think about lots of things going on at once. In other cases, a language is defined for a particular problem domain. So there's a media wiki markup language that was designed for generating static web pages that link to each other. And so it has built in elements for text formatting, as well as some cross page linking functionality. And now it's used to create all Wikipedia pages, which are defined in MediaWiki markup so that they can link to each other and express various forms of formatting. So in both of these cases, somebody created a new language and that had a profound impact on the way that computers are used. So a programming language has two elements. One is a syntax. So this tells us the legal statements and expressions in the language, what the text of the source code looks like. And then it has semantics or meaning. And these are the execution or evaluation rules for those statements and expressions. So you have to know what's allowed and you have to know what it does. Then you have a programming language. Now what actually specifies a programming language? Well, the way you create one is one of two ways. One, you write down how it works. So you can write down a specification, which is a document describing the precise syntax and semantics of the language. Scheme has a specification. Or you can have a canonical implementation, which is an interpreter or compiler for the language. So you write a program that knows how to interpret the language. And in that sense, you've created the language, although it's nice to have a lot of documentation to go along with it as well.